Call the meeting to order at 5.03. Um, and our first order of business, thank is good to see everybody, is to go over the minutes, to review and approve the minutes. To make a motion to approve Second. the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Maureen, Aye. yes. Maureen, yes. Bob, yes. Bob, yes. Okay. So I'm the new note taker today. Um, okay, next we'll hand it over to Shelly for the financial statements. Thank you for sending that information ahead of time. That was helpful. Yeah, um, I'm uh, happy to take questions as we go through, but basically I thought I would go through the report as I sent it. I'm not going to go line for line, but I'll give you summaries of each of the things that I shared. Um, I also shared the expenditure report, so if you have questions about those, I'm happy to take them too. Um, I'll try to talk, uh, keep it minimal, but clear and, and smooth. So um, to start off, we had uh, nine warrants signed electronically in July. Those were to close out fiscal year 20. Uh, that totaled $16,438.27. And then we signed uh, one batch of FY21 warrants electronically already. There were three in that batch totaling $18,811.17. Um, and if you didn't already get it this week, I know Michelle is preparing another one. So there'll be another batch of warrants coming to you electronically for August. Okay. Um, so to start with, we're going to talk about the general fund wrap up. So we met just about three months ago um, and talked about the remaining balance that was to be spent in fiscal year 20. Uh, at that point, we had put a budget freeze in place and only necessary expenditures were being approved. Uh, we had roughly 107,000 remaining in the Waitley Elementary budget to be spent. We had estimated that we would spend about 58,000, leaving 49,000 in the general fund uh, for other things, which we decided as a school committee to spend $20,000 on one-to-one -one technology initiative, which would get all of the students new Chromebooks. Um, so and then- Yes. Can I just interrupt you? You know what? Do you mind if I share your your report so people are watching sure. along? It, it makes it make far more sense when, you, when they're seeing the numbers. Sure. Um, and you put so much work into this, so sure. there we go. Right. <laughs> You're getting right. good. Keep, keep, keep going. <laughs> By the time any, if everyone attends all these meetings, they're going to have heard this five times by tomorrow night. So. Um, so we put in twenty thousand dollars for the got to go up a little bit darius uh down a little bit more at I least think. on my screen that looks accurate okay so we had agreed to spend twenty thousand dollars of the quote unquote savings from the budget freeze for the one-to-one -one technology initiative and then we agreed that any remaining money which at that time was a twenty nine thousand dollar estimate uh, we agreed that that would be put back into school choice in support of the fiscal year 21, which was going to be a level funded budget. So anything we saved from 20 would get reallocated back into choice for 21. Um, so I'm always conservative in my estimates and in looking at the numbers, um, the total amount remaining to be spent was higher than projected and expenditures were very, very minimal. Um, we had already had most everything allocated and encumbered, um, and the Chromebook purchase was covered by the Municipal CARES Act grant fully, um, so that's great news for us. So we were able to also save that $20,000, and as a result, uh, we made adjustments of $122,000 of reallocation of funds back into school choice for future use. Wow. So you thought it was going to be 49 or no 29 and we ended up with 122. Awesome. Yeah. So, so the, the 20 became the 49 pretty easily once we found out that the municipal's cares act was going to cover. And then, you know, we had had most everything encumbered. I left expenses in for um, utilities, not knowing what that was going to pan out to be, what our heating costs were going to pan out to be. And all of that stuff came in less than we anticipated. Um, right. We also did a good job of, of not really ordering even um, janitorial supplies unless needed and only doing, you know, absolutely mandatory maintenance. So we really ended up in a much better position than I was even projecting. I was surprised myself to see the numbers. But 
after triple checking, <laughs> they are <laughs> accurate. And uh, I'm happy to report that we were able to put over $100,000 back into school choice. Which is great. So this is a year we're going to need a lot more of that. So that's absolutely. Um, so Darius, if you can scroll down past the chart sort of to the narrative for, oh, up a little bit more. Good. Um, so we're going to talk about FY21 separately. I thought I would go through all of the 20 end of year stuff first. So the first thing we're going to look at is the school choice analysis where we closed out the year. Um, revenue was slightly higher than we anticipated, and that was because of special education increments. And expenditures were lower given the general fund at the end of the year because we could move all of those expenses off. Um, we ended up saving quite a bit of money. And it doesn't exactly match up to the 122 if you were looking at this chart but some of the salaries were actually less than we anticipated. It's just how things worked out in the year from the budget the prior year. Um, so we end, are ending up, Darius, you can scroll down a little bit more, um, with an increase in revolving funds of $155,000. And our end of year fund balance is $375,000. So we are in a far better position going into 21 than we were um, given the cost savings that we had to the general fund at, at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. um, so for the early childhood revolving, let's scroll to the narrative. Uh, we had talked about in May that there would be hardship to the early childhood program because we did not have tuition coming in at that time. Um, and we continued to pay salaries and wages um, as we had planned them, we didn't reduce any staff. So we knew that that was gonna be difficult given we had no tuition, um, but we did have some salaries and wages come in lower than we anticipated. And overall those changes resulted in a slightly lower end of year balance. The loss in revenue almost exactly offset the law or the gain in expenditures. Um, so we're ending up with just shy of $74,000 at the end of this year, end of 20, going into 21 to be used for future use. Right. School lunch revolving. Uh, we also had the situation where we knew we were going to have hardship because of the free breakfast and lunch that was provided for all. Um, we were grateful to be able to do that, but we also knew that we were still paying our staff and we would still have some expenses food costs related to um, providing meals still while we were closed. We did get some reimbursement from the government, so there was a little bit of revenue coming in. In the end, um, the net loss was uh, $20,511, which also included the purchase of a new steamer, which was around five or 6,000. So the program lost about 15,000 for the year, uh, given the closure. However, the fund balance does remain healthy going into FY21 at $48,000. Wow. Yeah, so I'm happy to take questions now. I know that that's, that's the wrap up of FY20 stuff. Um, if you have questions about 20 or do you want me to keep going on to 21? I, I mean, just to say thank you to everybody for managing the budget so well last year and, and keep putting us in a really good position to move forward. Definitely. Okay, so moving on to 21, um, there's no major changes or concerns to report at this time for Waitley Elementary. Um, if you look at the report, expenditures have been minimal outside of salaries and wages and operating costs such as utility, telephone, things like that. Um, for the month of July, there really wasn't a whole lot purchased. That'll gradually start changing, but you know we're really trying to keep things reined in, not knowing what was going to happen with the start of the year. Um, one thing that I did want to point out for Waitley is that, I don't know if you'll remember this, Katie, last year, one of my first meetings, you asked a question as to why the salaries weren't expended out for the full year. And do you remember that? I explained that mm -hmm. the database didn't accommodate that. So what we've done is I'm still working on some of the payroll pieces with the database, but I have gone ahead and asked um, the bookkeeping staff to allocate all of the expenditures for salaries and wages, even though we, we pay them on an every two week basis. So what we can do now is see out for the full year what the true costs of those salaries and wages are. And it gives us a better look at the, um, 
end of year or not the end of year balance, the available balance as it's today. So I did make that change. So I think that that'll be better for us to look at moving forward. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, So what the budget is for next year. Did we, did we finalize a new budget or are we sticking with the same budget? I forget where we ended up with that. Um, we decided on a level funded budget. So the budget oh. for 21 is the exact same as it was for 20. Okay. Okay, school choice. Um, so as I said, we're starting off the year with a much higher balance than we anticipated. Um, the expenditures are higher than what we talked about at the last meeting where we had a financial update. And this is because I've added $40,000 in COVID related expenditures. That money has not been spent yet, but is earmarked there in the event that we need it. I wanted to make sure that we had some pot of money held for us as available. Um, And even with that, we are looking at ending fiscal year 21, assuming that the numbers remain the same, which Chrissy and I have had conversations about school choice. Um, Last we talked, the outgoing kids seem to be offset by the incoming kids, although there is, you know, as you know, there can be some fluctuation there. Um, but we are looking at ending fiscal year 21 with just over 300000 in school choice. Um, we might have additional expenses that we have to cover from this fund at some point this year, but right now school choice is in very good shape. And one more comment with that $40,000 related to COVID, we will um exhaust all grant funding opportunities whether that's town related or school related for grants before we start using that forty thousand that's earmarked in school choice i have a question yep the twenty thousand dollars that we got from somewhere for chromebooks does that mean every kid has a chromebook now is that what that that twenty thousand dollars was to buy more (laughs) So that's the idea, was that every kid would have a one-to-one device. However, I have heard that Chromebooks are on back order, so we don't physically have them in hand yet, but the order is placed. And the order that um, Scott Paul, the IT director, did put in was for every student to have a Chromebook. Okay. What kind of shape are we in right now with Chromebooks at the school? Chrissy. Uh, Chrissy, Uh, can you speak to that? Um, we definitely have enough Chromebooks for all of the students who may need one. Um, we easily covered the the students who needed to borrow one in the spring, um, and we have we have plenty more if there are additional kids who need them. The idea behind the one to one was that um, it would solve some of the technology issues that folks were having at home because all the students were on sort of different kinds of devices. And so it was difficult for tech support on our end to sort of troubleshoot everything that was going on, not knowing what kind of device kids were using. So um, we really want to get those one-to-ones in everyone's hands as soon as they come off the boat. Do we have a date at all on that boat? No. It, it's, it's more complicated than just a back order. Um, but last I heard, it was late October. <clears throat> That's correct. But we have enough to, for the kids that may need yeah. them. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. So looking at the early childhood revolving for fiscal year 21, um, because the end of the year, despite the COVID hardship, we still landed in a good spot there. So because of that, we will also be able to cover all of our expenses in this account for this year. Um, Revenue will be down once again. Um, And, and, you know, early childhood is one of those sort of moving targets for us because of the remote plan versus in person. We're not exactly sure what families can come as of yet based on the schedule that we're proposing. Um, But revenue is significantly lower. We're only looking at about $17,000 in revenue. Um, which is a big cut from what we had planned on. So um, even though that's the case, we still have a good starting balance and we will be able to cover our expenditures, which is around 70,000. And we're looking at ending the year just over 21,000 in the early childhood revolving account. 
Now, should revenue change, you know, we're going to have to reconsider whether or not we need to pay some wages out of a different funding source. Um, and I also think, while I'm relieved that we can get through this year, we need to be looking at 21 already because clearly $21,000 without a significant increase in revenue is not going to cover our teaching staff. And we will be required, um, even if we can't even if we aren't having um, typically developing, you know, non-special needs students in the early childhood program, we are required by law to cover the special education needs. So, sorry, can you hear my dog whining over there? <laughs> sorry. Um, we will still have to have teaching staff to cover the special education needs. So it's not like we can avoid having these expenditures. So we're gonna have to get creative in how we're covering expenses going into 22, which seems far away, but in real reality, it's not. We're already thinking about budget planning for next fiscal year. So this is definitely on my radar. Um, and the last account I think we're gonna talk about before we talk about grant funding is the school lunch revolving. So the projections for school lunch are still um, a work in progress. We're still trying to determine, you know, when lunches are going to be served, how it'll be served, trying to estimate what students will still want lunch at school versus bringing their own. Um, DESE currently has this program where everyone is getting free lunches. That expires on 831, but they might extend that. So if they do, we would only have government revenue coming in. And even if they don't, we do anticipate that revenue would be much less than a typical year. Um, so our known expenditures right now for Waitley Elementary are around 36,000 and that's for salaries and wages. Um, if you recall, what we did last year was the school lunch revolving fund in Waitley had a significant balance and we wanted to use up some of that balance because it's not necessary to carry, you know, 70, $80,000 for example and um, the state doesn't like to see that necessarily in the school lunch fund. So we moved some expenditures, which also attributes to the general fund savings. We moved salaries and wages directly into school lunch. Does this ring a bell to school committee that mm -hmm. we did this? So what yeah. I'm recommending, um, even though I have them planned right now to be paid from school lunch, we also budgeted them in the general fund, not knowing how things would pan out with this account. And given the health of the general fund right now with expenditures being low, it's my recommendation that we continue to pay school lunch from general fund and leave the school lunch balance there to cover food costs and unknown expense expenditures that might come up, as well as give us a cushion for um, any further reduction in revenue. Mm -hmm. Any questions about any of that? Because that wraps up the revolving funds for FY21. I have a question. Yep. Typically, typically we we were paying salaries out of the lunch program and we always were in a deficit for years and years and years and years. And we always had to get money, correct me if I'm wrong, or, Maybe you don't remember, but we used to take the money out of school choice to pay, you know, the, I get my reds and my blacks mixed up, whatever the deficit is that we used to take, we used to take the money out of school choice because we didn't want a negative balance. So now we're having a positive balance. Should we take some of that extra money that we might have had and put it back into school choice possibly? I'm just, and I'm only asking about that because for years we that's how we used to um, be. I guess so there I, everybody froze on me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I don't think we can move that money around like that. Can we, Shelly? Can't doesn't that money have to stay in the food? The no oh, Shelly's frozen now. Are you are you there? Sorry, my computer froze. I couldn't see anyone or hear anything. Um I do can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. So I, I think we need to leave the school lunch funds where they are. Um, we're, we, I believe historically, Bob, you're correct that the school lunch program used to run in a deficit. 
And that's part of the reason my understanding why the wages started to get paid from the general fund and not directly from school lunch. We built up this balance. We had, um, see what we started the year with. Last year, we started FY21 with almost 70,000. And so we decided to pay the wages out of there, which we did. And now we're ending the year at 48,000. And while I still think that that is um, a higher balance, I think we wanna leave that money there for right now. I think we wanna pay those salaries out of the general fund because they're in the general fund budget already and leave that 48 because right now we have no idea what the revenue is going to be. So if we don't have revenue coming in but we still have food costs going out, that 58,000 is gonna dwindle really quickly. Um, so I, I'm thinking we give it a couple of months and then we decide if we wanna make some changes there once we know what the revenues are gonna look like and have a better idea of how many kids are gonna be eating at school and what's the state gonna decide for us. I'm, I'm, gonna, be, I'm gonna be like a Mr. Decker and say, you know, I wanna know all the costs, you know, between health insurance and all that stuff. and. Are we in the black? Are we in the red? I'm just, I was just asking because all those years we were always in a deficit. And I'm glad to see that the changes that were made that were, were on the good side now. And, you know, it, it means like somebody's really doing a really good job there in that position. Mary's doing a great job. Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank so you. I think School lunch is definitely something we have to keep a very close eye on for this year and for next year um, for 22 planning. So school lunch and then the um, early childhood account, those are the ones that we're going to have some consistent conversations about and have to make some decisions on where to fund those positions from in future years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last piece, if there's no other questions on that, I wanna just give everybody some insight on the COVID grant funding that we've received to date. Um, we did get $20,000 that I mentioned already from the Municipal CARES Act grant that covered the one-to-one -one technology initiative. There's some additional money that we'll get back for, um, we bought some sprayers to clean and sanitize the building and then the product for that. But part of that is FEMA reimbursable, so we only get a small percentage. So I didn't put that exact figure in here. The Chromebooks felt most important to talk about. Um, and then there is an additional elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund grant that Waitley is receiving an additional $20,000 for. Um, we will spend that on professional development, technology, and COVID-related supplies and materials. It can, that money can also be used for non-COVID expenditures that would normally be funded through the Title I grant. So um, it, is, it is available for other needs if we come across a, a point where we have to make some decisions on how we're gonna pay for something. And then the uh, last pot of money that we have right now is from the Coronavirus Relief Fund. This is also a DESI grant that they put out. Uh, it's $225 per pupil in our foundation budget. So it only counts town residents. It doesn't count any um, school choice students. And so Waitley is receiving $17,100 from that grant. This grant is for COVID related only expenditures and they have to be unbudgeted expenditures. So they're earmarked currently for technology and COVID supplies and materials. And I will be working with Chrissy to make sure that we have a budget and plans on how to spend that money because we have to spend it by December 31st, whereas the other funds have a longer timeline. Uh, so Waitley is looking at $57,100 in grant funding currently, and we've spent just over 31,000. So there's about 25,000 remaining for additional COVID related expenditures. Um, and then I did learn today or yesterday um, from Chrissy that the town has also offered to help the school out with the purchase of some tents, um, which will come out of town funding. I'm not sure if it's grant related or otherwise, but that's also good news so that we could save the COVID money that we've received uh, for other expenses, because we are trying to put tents up outside for outdoor learning. 
That's great. So that money is one-time money we can use for things before we go to the general fund or to the school choice monies. Correct. Okay, any question, other questions for Shelly on the plans? I have I have one question about the early childhood and how we're, how we're what are we planning for that? But maybe that belongs more in the plan discussion. Um, this, you know, what is the plan for early childhood going forward? Is that part of what you're gonna share later? Yeah, we could share that later unless Chrissy wants to. Chrissy's frozen on my screen, so I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you yep. Hear you? Okay. Um, I'm kind of out in the sticks, so if my internet goes, I'll call in. Um, it's a fancy cabin. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have, um, as always, a high number of families who are interested in participating in our pre-K program. And it's it's obviously a program we're really proud of. It's a great program. And um, we have a fairly low number of students who needed to be prioritized. We obviously want to be able to offer that uh, program for our students who have special needs. Um, but that left us with a lot of spaces, but not enough. We need to keep the number much smaller given the health guidelines. So what we came up with was offering families um, a two day a week program so that we can offer this, this pre-K experience to as many families as possible. Um, I'm still waiting to hear back from some families who were trying to coordinate things to just determine whether or not um, they could make a two day a week program work. So we are taking new families into the program. We've, we've covered the priority families first, they're yes. set, and then we're opening it up to new families, yes. but it's only on a two day a week. And it's obviously in school, right? Yes, it's, it's in, um, you know, remote doesn't, can work with the, the younger ones, but it wasn't, wasn't a, a great success as you can imagine having, you know, three-year-olds try and learn in, right. this, in this format. Um, although someone pointed out that Mr. Rogers did it for decades, so we should, <laughs> we should be able to figure that out too. Um, and so how many you know, how many kids at a time will be in preschool? On a I don't have day? the final numbers now, but um, you know we had 19 families who were registered, and so we broke that in half. So if everyone could make it work, and that's not going to be the case, unfortunately, but if everyone could make it work, we would have 10 and 9. And, and then that's Shelly, what you were basing your projection on for the revenues? The, or was yes. yours done before you knew all that? Um, I had taken information what, from what Amy, the preschool director, provided, which was based on 10 students. Um, and I don't think it mattered how, what the breakdown was of when they were in school. It was still going to equate, equate to 10 students. Um, paying for, and it's not all 10 are paying because the special okay. education students often don't have tuition. Um, so I can't remember in Waitley, it might have only been four or five students that were actually paying. Okay. But we're essentially at capacity, it sounds like, and, and there isn't room for more revenue at early childhood at this point. Correct. There? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad that we're able to keep that going because I think that's really important. Okay, any other questions on the financials? No? So um, we have public comment. I guess what I would ask is if people could, if you have a public comment that you'd like to share with the committee, if you could put your name in the chat and we will um, call on you. I think that worked well with the big meeting. Um, so Holly, I see that you're on the list. Yep. Why don't let you go first? That'd be great. Okay, thanks. Um, as you probably all know by now, Holly Johnson, co-chair of the CPAC. I have a statement I'd like to read on behalf of CPAC, but first I just have um, a little comment of my own. Um, I was under the impression that teachers wouldn't feel forced back into the building and that teachers who were not comfortable could teach the students who choose remote only. Um, but now I'm hearing a lot that the district sent something out saying that teachers are expected to be in the building for five full days unless they take family medical leave. Um, I just concerned about that and I wanted to mention it. Um, and now I'm going to read my CPAC statement. 
Um, first of all, I really want to thank all of you for putting our concerns on your agenda tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time to discuss the specific needs of special education students. Um, as I'm sure you know from our many, many emails, we are deeply concerned about special education this fall. As the CPEC has said many times, DESE issued guidance stating that even if the rest of the school has entered into a hybrid or remote model of instruction, schools and districts must make every effort to maintain in-person instruction for students with disabilities, particularly those with significant and complex needs and preschool students. The guidelines go on to list the six categories that define a student with complex and significant needs. One, students identified as high needs on their IEP, meaning they spend more than 75% of their day outside the general ed classroom. Two, students who cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability. Three, students who use aided communication. Four, homeless students. Five, students in foster care. And six, students identified as English learners. However, we keep hearing that the district is zeroing in on only one of the six categories. Last week at the Sunderland School Committee meeting, we heard from the special ed director that students, um, that only students really in substantially separate placement programs would be prioritized for in-person SPED services this fall. Those students make up a very small percentage of all the SPED students in this district. Also, that would mean that no students at Waitley, according to the district, would be prioritized as we don't have a separate SPED classroom. Now, I know that we have great teachers and a principal that really would not let that happen, but it is concerning that we're not hearing that from the leaders in the district over and over again. Um, so we have asked multiple times, parents and the CPAC have asked for clarification, but we keep hearing the same answers. The guidance says, all students with disabilities should be prioritized for in-person instruction. All students. Then, among all the students with disabilities, schools should pay particular attention to pre-K and the six previously mentioned categories. But this district is not saying that, and parents are justifiably very upset and scared for their children. Also, at the Sunderland meeting, it was said, I think Karen said, that many special education students will not have official IEP meetings before returning this fall. Instead, they will have informal phone calls or emails which leave parents with no rights or protections. Parents may not know what their child's learning plan is until days before school starts. Families would not know how many days of school their child qualifies for, what services would be available to them in person versus remotely, what health and safety accommodations their child will have, how behavioral issues will be managed and cannot plan for childcare until days before the school year begins. Also, a family could choose remote instruction, but still be interested in in-person services as a drop-in in a community setting or at home, as stated in the DESTI guidelines. Our CPAC survey showed that most of the families who responded wanted in-person services, with approximately 40% of them wanting them in as a drop-in, in-home, or community setting, as opposed to part of their daily in-person instruction. I don't know that SPED teachers or IAs have even been asked um, what setting they would be comfortable in delivering these services in. We as a CPAC haven't really seen a, an outline of possible options for SPED students. And there has to be a contingency plans for the possibility of going full remote. Um, issues with special education system in this district are not new. They are coming to light with the pandemic. DESE has provided guidelines on what should be happening for special education students, and our district seems to have decided to pick and choose which sections they will follow, leaving hundreds of students at risk for lifelong inequities. We are asking the school committee to intervene before these children fall through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, um, Holly. Is that something we want to respond to now, or do we want to talk about it as we get talk about the plan, Darius, do you think? this question of um, the clarity around the special ed. I know we have that on our agenda to talk about the CPAC. It's on the agenda, unless you're gonna, you wanna change the format. Why don't we, yeah, why don't we just focus on that when the when the agenda comes up? So let's remember those concerns. Um, okay, and there's no one else. Any other public comment? I know we have a lot to cover, so I don't mean to rush people, but if there's no one else, we will move over to the new business. Um, <laughs> And 
I will hand it over to Darius to walk us through the update on the guidance and the data, community data metrics. Sure. Um, so I do have Meg Birch, our, our nurse leader, on with us today, who's who is the put a ton of work into creating um, these uh, data metrics. We did share them at the Sunderland meeting, so for those who were there, will be a repeat there. But um, Meg's going to kind of try to go through. Um, I'm going to present my screen again. These matrix, which really talks about, you know, what is the community. Well, let Meg talk about it instead of giving a long introduction. How about that? There it is. And I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and go pretty quickly through the slides to just make sure there's enough time for questions. Um, so, um, oops. oops, sorry, I hit share instead of present because I wanted to share it with all of you and not present it with all of you. You know, all right. All right. So I'm putting this on all of the presentations I'm doing. Just you know, reminder for us all that um, really the key components in this uh, COVID pandemic are the masks, physical distancing, hand washing, and staying home if you don't feel well. So um, I just kind of, that's my plug. Um, in looking at um, data metrics, and we went down, we, we sort of got in doing this because we weren't getting um, clear guidance from the state, um, though there are data on their website. And um, as we were working on um, data metrics, as I sort of zeroed in on four sources of data, the um, weekly health report that comes out um, on Wednesdays from on the DPH dashboard, the daily uh, information, which does include percent positivity, which is currently 1.4% for the state, which is the lowest it's been. Um, that 1.4 is the lowest it's been um, during the pandemic since the, since they started tracking that. Um, the New York Times, um, they have an interactive map um, where you can get case counts by county. Um, and then the Harvard's Global Health Institute also has an interactive dashboard um, that tends to have about a two day lag um, of data, but you can get county level data from there as well. So some of you may have seen a version of, uh, you know, the state has their own version of this uh, metric. Um, basically, they are assigning a color, um, red, yellow, green, to all towns in Massachusetts based on the average daily cases per 100,000. Um, and then they have this unshaded or white um, for, uh, for the map, which represents um, a town or municipality with less than five cases over the past 14 days. I want to note that that's a different measure than the ones used for the red, yellow, green. So we're kind of comparing apples and oranges and the state doesn't report data less than five for any community under um, 50,000. So, um, which I think is why, where they came up with the white was trying to figure out how to capture data. Um, so the next slide, this ties into part of this, this is the metric that came out last week. Their suggestion from um, the command center in DESE is that if you have more than eight cases um, per 100,000, and again, these are adjusted, um, that, that indicates, you know, level of, um, of infection in the community that you would be only doing considering remote learning. Four to eight, they say you could do hybrid um, or remote if there's extenuating circumstances, which they don't define, and they're kind of indicated from what I've heard that those extenuated circumstances would be determined at the local level. Um, and then um, under four, they consider that to be, um, you know, that you would be able to do full person in learning or hybrid with extenuating circumstances. Um, they, do, they do note that um, other data are important to consider, that these, this metric that they un, uh, put out last week um, is just one part of the data. They um, suggest that communities should put together uh, local and regional data that are relevant, and they've also indicated that they will come out with regional data um, for smaller communities, um, and whether that would be school community, school district level or county level data isn't clear, and um, 
they updated the map today that is online, but um, they didn't make any substantive changes. So, so we we had also been working on indicators um, and in trying to think about how do we prioritize the data sources and and kind of make a decision based on it. Um, we by proposing primary data indicators, uh, secondary data indicators, and tertiary. So the primary are going to be the DPH data, um, regional data, when that, and we'll get into that. But the thought is that a primary indicator would it would sort of trigger um, a 14-day closure. Um, if any of our communities were in the yellow or, um, I mean, I, I you know, in the in the red certainly. Um, <laughs> If we had more than eight cases per hundred thousand, um, that would that would be a big a big deal. Um, secondary indicators that's going to be something we think about um, asking about a shorter term closure to allow assessment by the local board of health and public health nurse, um, and to be looking at local or regional indicators. And last would be something that would would basically be kind of a flag where we would want to be. Um, consulting with the local board of health, the four town or regional, um, or you know, just the individual town to say what's going on here. We're seeing an uptick of absences or such, um, and we want to see what's going on. So, next slide. So, I kind of went into some pieces of this. Um, so the primary indicators are, is that the metric from DESE, their average daily cases um, per 100,000, if that is, um, as long as that's under eight, we're considering that um, things are reasonable. We're also gonna be watching the seven day weighted average of positive tests, to, that that stays below 5% at the state level. Um, that is currently, the, that's what's currently 1.4. And then um, when there's a regional indicator available so we can have countywide data or uh, district-wide data, that would be considered a primary indicator. Uh, and I've been in conversations with uh, Phoebe Walker at the FERCOG and other public health nurses um, and advocating in different ways for the state to provide us with regional data. Um, so... <laughs> Hey, can I ask a question? Do you want to do, do you, I'll, wait, I'll wait to the end. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to be quick. I set my timer. Nope. So I've got. No, nope. I just had a question. That's all. But I'll wait. I'll wait until you get done. Um, so, um, okay. So the secondary indicators we're going to be looking at, are there confirmed COVID cases in the previous 14 days, as long as that's under 25 for Franklin County as a whole. And that be excluding a congregate setting such as a nursing home um, where it was really a confined um, uh, series of cases. Um, I am looking to calculate or have somebody help us uh, as a region calculate the percent positive um, and trying to ha have that stay below 3% for Franklin County. Um, I think 5% would be too high given um, the interconnectedness of our communities. Um, and then we're looking at um, aggregate data um, that would be saying for Franklin and Hampshire counties combined, less than 10 cases per day or 70 cases per week. And that would have to be weighted, um, adjusted, you know, at 100,000 population. So it wouldn't be a straight case count for that. And then the last, as I mentioned before, we would be looking at trends. If, if data are staying pretty level or they're decreasing in terms of numbers, that's obviously something that's good. If it's starting to increase, we would wanna watch that and not wait until it got um, above one of our thresholds without trying to gather more information. We, I'm proposing um, and working with the nurses and how we would monitor internal data so that we dismissed um, more than 1.9% of the building census, so whatever students and staff are expected to be in the building each day or had an absence greater than 10% of expected, um, that would be something that would flag 
um, for us that something was, um, that we had a concern that, that maybe something was happening. And, and the 1.9 is, um, it's the, the baseline for influenza like illness for new England and anything over 1.9% of, of, um, that those influenza like illness is considered, um, a higher than what you would expect. So absent a COVID, um, baseline, that seemed a reasonable thing to say if we're seeing symptoms that, um, you know, of illness that, and, and for Waitley, we're, we're talking about two or three kids with the same symptoms that we would be um, wanting to review what was happening. Um, and then, you know, looking to the local boards of health as they are getting information on um, reports of increased positive test results in the district, in the town or in the district. Um, and um, we would want that to be factored into our assessment of, of um, what was happening in the schools. And the last slide, I think it's the last slide, um, is sort of my, you know, my summary of what I'm, what I'm thinking in terms of closure scenarios. These, you know, these would be made by the local board of health in collaboration with the district. Um, you know, I, there, a long-term closure greater than 14 days would be if we have widespread transmission in the community, um, the primary indicators are staying high with no indication that they're going to level off or decrease. Um, a 14 day district or building closure, school specific closure would be again, you know, the indication that there's community spread and the potential for transmission within the school. Um, and, and then it would only open again if those primary indicators remained below the threshold. Um, and then short term closures, one to three or three to five days would be to allow for a full assessment of big data. Um, and trying to determine what the next step is, whether the schools would um, remain closed, would open, and again, that would be determined by the local board of health um, in consultation with the district. And you know, a short-term closure could always be extended um, based on the available data and the and the situation. But it seems prudent to really cl close down and and see what's going on if there's a concern about. Um, uh, cases. It was almost under 10 minutes. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Okay. So Bob, and, Bob and Maureen, do you guys have questions for Meg? Yep. Um, Meg, I've been, I watch the news every morning and Channel 40 puts a little ticker taker on the bottom for, you know, I don't look at Eastern Mass because the numbers are skyrocketing, but we'll say in Franklin County, it's been stuck on 411 for for, a, for as long as I can remember, which means a week to 10 days or even two weeks. The other indicator you were talking about, if there's something in the community, not so much in the school, but if we get a spike in the community, that could shut the school down without even having any cases in the school, correct? I think if there is a, if there is a high enough number of cases in the community, um, I think, I think yes. And, and, to, to allow for some assessment and, and um, to see if if what we have in place and if what's happening is really separate from the school. Um, you know, we're interconnected communities. Um, so it just seems prudent if that if we are if we are seeing a high number of cases that are indicative of community spread. Um, even if we don't have a case in the school, I think it would be cause for concern. Okay. And what do you think about being stuck? I, like I said, I just watch the news in the morning. I don't, I don't get a newspaper. I don't go online. I, you know, maybe I should, but sometimes <laughs> too many things online can really make some people's minds go wacky. And yeah. I, you know, I just, I just look at local at 411, and like I said, it's been there for a long time. So that's a good sense that. In Franklin County, and I'm only talking about Franklin County, that we're in pretty good shape. I, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, looking at the data earlier, Waitley has no new cases in the last 14 days, according to the what's on the website for um, for the DPH. 
Um, I, I think, you know, I think the whole, the, 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 the message about wearing masks when you're out and social distancing and staying home if you're sick and, you know, all of those precautions um, have certainly made a difference. And I think that um, the public health nurses and, um, and boards of health in the community have been really diligent in following up on um, cases where they do occur. Um, and so where there have been cases, they've, they've, to my, I'm not aware of cases, at least in our towns that are covered by, um, that I, I'm, I'm working partly as a part-time as a contact tracer for the uh, cooperative public health service. Um, but, and I'm not aware of, of cases where we really determined it was community spread. You know, it would, we'd sort of figure out the index case and it would be household members and that would be it. Um, is really what what the experience has been so far. So I and I do attribute it to people taking it seriously and doing their part to um, protect others. Thanks. I'm not, I'm not sure Maureen. if this is I'm not sure if this is the right place to ask, but where are we with in terms of having a school nurse in Waitley? We um, have an interview scheduled. I believe I'm looking at Chrissy where she is on the on on Thursday. Um, so we're we've, we've been interviewing candidates. Um, we're in the hiring process. Um, so can I, can I follow up on that and ask a question about governance of the, the indicators and the issues? So I'm very grateful that we created this role for Matt, you, Meg, and that you're in it now <laughs> that we have my understanding is you're a coordinator across all the schools of the nurses and yeah. Now you're getting the fun task of keeping track of all the health indicators and things. So could you just talk us through though how you're gonna work with Waitley as an individual school? So the nurse search is continuing. The nurse will be a key point person for you in, in this work. How how does the school operate, you know, once they're up and running and using these indicators and Who's the liaison with the Board of Health is the other piece that I'm curious with because each town has their own Board of Health. Correct. Um, so, one, you know, one of the things, um, so I, I see my role is working very closely with the school nurse um, and providing the support um, to be doing our internal um, monitoring of data. Um, I'm looking right now at adding something to our electronic health record that would allow us to sort of run a report on a, on a regular basis. Um, there are ways that I can set that up, um, but there may be a way that makes it a little more, um, add, add some, uh, makes it automatic. Um, that, mm -hmm. that report is generated and that report can be shared by email. Um, so you had a lot of questions. Um, I, in well, terms of, yeah, in, in terms of the liaison, um, I would, one of the things that I would want to have be a priority once a new nurse is hired um, is sitting down with um, whoever the liaison is from the Board of Health and the public health nurse um, that I understand is now on board for COVID response. Um, and um, really looking at what we have in place and what the, what the communication um, looks like. My feeling is that if we have, um, certainly if we have a case, uh, one of the first calls is to the Board of Health, to whoever our designated contact person is to say we've been, you know, well, and you honestly, the school doesn't have access to Maven. So you you likely, unless a parent or a family staff person tells us, you're going to be notifying us of a positive case um, in terms of a test result in May then. Um, and in terms of our, our other indicators, we would be saying, um, contacting the Board of Health to say, we're having, you know, we've got had a few kids with symptoms that we're concerned about um, and, you know, let's talk about what our next step is. And um, to the point of saying, can we look at identifying these, uh, this cohort as close contacts and ask them to remain home um, if symptoms are concerning enough? Um, or, or if, again, if the numbers are such and uh, other data indicators um, are starting to increase, that might be a place where we're having a conversation about closing. 
Um, I expect to be looking at data um, unless the state comes out with something that makes it really easy for us to do this. I expect to be right, you know, either looking at the data or working right now. I'm working with FERCOG. I'm in conversation with them to see if they have somebody in a role there that could be calculating these data for all of our communities. And so providing mm -hmm. us with um, county level data and the regional data that would allow us to make a, a an appropriate decision based on numbers that are relevant for our small towns. Mm -hmm. um, I've been talking um, about and thinking about how we're gonna manage the contact tracing. Um, mm -hmm support the Board of Health in that, um, thinking that the school's role would be to provide that information in the format that um, could easily be uploaded to Maven if that was appropriate. There's a, that spreadsheet for community clusters, close contacts. Um, I don't know who does your Maven. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't Mike, know either. Okay. Michael, <laughs> Michael, Michael Slater. So, so I know I've had conversations with um, Lisa White um, about, you know, just there's that there's a spreadsheet. And so what I'm looking at is making sure we can easily take the information that we have for cohorts, take the logs, the attendance, who the bus um, rosters, who was on the buses and be able to to quickly um, compile that information. Mm -hmm. um, in the form that would be useful and and easily um, uploaded to Maven and then be working with the local board of health to say, what calls do you want the school nurse or do you want me to make? Um, I, you know, honestly, if we're in a situation where we're concerned about close contacts, um, I totally see my role as supporting the school and Chrissy and the nurse and the board of health and making those phone calls and reaching out to the community. Um, the trick of course will be confidentiality because we would be able to say we're aware of a case. That's all we can say, you know, in a small school, do you just send home the first grade? Eh, I think that that is um, opening us up for um, some challenges to maintaining confidentiality. And so then the question would be for the Board of Health can we close the whole school and just say we have a positive case and you know people who are close contacts will be you know identified i can see the school helping to send out the quarantine and isolation notices um you know some of that could be email blast if appropriate um chrissy i'm i'm sure knows the families that would need paper copies you, you know mailed or delivered to them so Really, it's whatever, you know, I see my role in this nurse's role as managing whatever is happening with the Board of Health in whatever way we can do that. But once we have someone on board, I would hope to be meeting with the Board of Health um, to kind of talk through and go over um, what we've got. And I don't know, Darius, was <laughs> anything else? We're, you know, we're working on this um, not quite round the clock. Um, yeah. Right. But what I hear you saying, and I think is what we want to hear, is that the Board of Health is, needs to be very involved and in sync with everything that you guys are doing in the schools. And you're going to be supporting oh. their work. And they are obviously looking out for our Waitley's best interest in this. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, and I, you know, I know in my, in my, you know, some of the conversations I've had with Lisa White or other public health nurses has been more of the help me think this through kind of conversation to the to the level of if we send home, you know, if we close and we have 15 people that are close contacts, but then there's also this positive case in any of their community contacts, you know, do we say we'll work on getting the information and maybe make initial phone calls to the school contacts that are different than the community contacts, allowing the Board of Health to focus on the community contacts and then providing the information to the Board of Health. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to me, you know, exactly how the mechanism, how, how the mechanics of that work is going to be dependent on the town mm -hmm. and is going to be dependent on what, um, what, 
what works for the Board of Health and what what systems and processes you already have in place. Um, right, we're going to have to get much more fluent in how everything is working. Um, <laughs> and we're all figuring this out as we go along, a lot of it. Um, so we're not really supposed to take questions from the public right now, but I see some people want to ask questions. Um, I think, Michael, you, you look like you had something you wanted to ask. And Kathy, Darius, are you okay if we take one or two questions on this? Because it's an important topic. You're the chair. It's your meeting. Okay. Michael, any quick I'll, question? I'll be, I'll, I'll be quite brief. I'm a member of the Board of Health. Um, yes, of course, we've been very focused on this issue. We are wide open to whatever recommendations um, are coming through from, um, from, the, um, uh, from the group. And so we have... Um, already established um, uh, relationships with public health nurses that are doing um, contact tracing, and um, we're 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 open to working. Uh, we have I, I, there was seemed to be a bit of um, uh, question about who to contact. Um, our district health agent, Mark Bushy, um, is available at two six eight eight four zero four, and so if there's any questions or concerns. Um, that you want the Board of Health of, of Waitley to address. Mark is our district health agent, um, okay. and he'll be prepared to, to take those calls, and uh, and we're very interested and, and very focused on this issue and, and want to be helpful. So that's it. Right. Yeah, I think it's, thanks. I, I, I see it as a team effort, so. Um, and then Catherine wrote, curious how we will keep track of all the towns. Oh, sorry, disappeared off my screen. <laughs> um, the school choice, yeah. So <clears throat> curious how we will keep track of all the towns that school choice children come from in regards to the number of cases in the communities and how does that affect the school? So I, I was thinking the same thing is that not everybody in the teachers also don't all come from right. white. So right. how are we thinking about you know, monitoring the other schools, I mean, the other towns, or is that the sort yep. of countywide indicators that you're thinking about? Um, um, I mean, the, 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 the countywide indicators will certainly, you know, provide context and, and give us some information, but I've, um, I've been participating in meetings um, all summer with um, public health nurses from Franklin County. Um, and uh, Jenny Meyer, the public health nurse from Northampton has been part of most of those meetings. Um, and, and the focus of the conversation has been on, um, how are we, you know, how, how are we going to collaborate within the constraints of confidentiality to support the work that we're all doing? Um, and so I've been working on building the relationships, um, with the nurses from other Franklin County towns. And certainly through my contact tracing work, I have relationships with Number of nurses in Hampshire County. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow of the public health nurses that the um, other area school nurse leaders are invited to. Um, and from conversations I've had with other school nurse leaders, there is a strong commitment from them to streamline um, our protocols and our metrics and our processes so that we are able to basically have a sort of Franklin County response um, that is supportive of the boards of health and protective of the school is, is kind of kind of what we're aiming for so um, you know, and, and I was actually in conversation with two different public health nurses today um, trying to sort of sort out that communication piece at what point do, do, would we expect a call from another town that they have a resident that attends our school or works in our school. At what point would we make that call? Um, you know, it's one of the challenges of having 351 boards of health. And 351 schools, <laughs> right. Or 331, yeah. So Whatever, yeah. And, and so we know where the teachers live and where the students are coming from. So we can monitor the towns ourselves, but right. getting consistent as we can seems like a good goal across right. and, yeah and i you know i think i i think it's going to come down to communication and i think it's going to come down to you know really 
active monitoring of what regional indicators we can monitor so that if we know we, you know, know our numbers in terms of how many, um, I know our school choice numbers, I don't know numbers and, you know, or I, I've looked at our school choice numbers in terms of other towns. I don't know our numbers in terms of where staff reside. Um, you know, and, you know, to some degree would be relying on staff to report to us um, their status in a timely fashion so that we could then um, do what, what, you know, coordinate with the Board of Health to do what we needed to do in terms of identifying close contacts. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be mindful of that as we move forward, this whole school choice and different um, locations, not just Little Whaley that we're focused on here. Absolutely. Um, so thank you, Meg, for all your work. I know there's a lot going on with this and this is so important. Your, your role is so important. And again, I'm so grateful that we have you in it, especially as Whaley is still looking for a nurse and that hopefully um, we can get someone identified soon to fill that role and play, help with a lot of this communication going forward. Yeah. Um, Darius, thank anything you. else on this or any other questions from the board? No? Okay, I know we have a lot to cover, so let's move on to the next topic, um, which has to do with the plans and where things stand in terms of the overall opening. So um, the overall opening. So it, there's a lot of things in motion right now. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a three ring, you know, it's called a circus, but it's a three ring issue of trying to reopen in the sense that we have so many things in the air. Um, I do have kind of a, a, a rather kind of you'll say a significant announcement tonight that um i'm proposing that the um the school district delay its opening in the hybrid model for two weeks um basically what's what's happened so basically going remote for to the first two weeks of school after the 10 days of professional development really what the we've run into administratively um is you know I'm, right now we're we're still negotiating with the union we are also trying to work on uh, meeting the needs of the staff with through their account accommodations that they may need for work and also shifting staffing through work. Um, we're also looking at the child care issues that staffing has um, that are very real um, and how um, teachers can be able to do their jobs if they have their own children. Um, and then, you know, we're also, I got a, a, a notice from the Board of Health regarding concerns about the Labor Day weekend. And that, that beginning that week, that week alone was a concern following the data trend following the 4th of July weekend. And that if, you know, could I push it out a few days and then we start talking about a few days and then um, we also are still behind in acquiring tents and such as well. So there's a lot of, and then there's everything kind of else. The, the infrastructure within each building, trying to get everything set for um, the kids um, and such and to do it all. The, the idea originally was that we'll get this all done during the professional development weeks um, in which we may be able to get it all done, but I am concerned about creating an artificial timeline that, um, you know, I'll be honest, as, a, as the school leader, I'm responsible for this in the sense that I walked up to the buffet line with a plate that I thought I could put a lot on and, and get it all done. And realistically, um, I need to roll it out slower. Um, and so we created a schedule. This is a very much a draft. This is, so the timeline on this is so like, where is this coming out of? It is coming out of the blue. The administrative team meeting met yesterday morning. Um, I kind of, after thinking over the weekend and trying to get through things during the weekend of list of stuff we had to do, we I brought it to the principals and there was kind of a sigh because they were very concerned about making all these deadlines as such as well. So um, we created an outline. This is um, it's actually, I think it's the first public debut lately, even though you're in W school. You are first. Last but not least. Right? You're last but not least, but first on this particular thing. Um, you know, I did share it briefly with the association in negotiations earlier today. Um, but and then we'll be sending this out for people to consume. Whoop, that's not it. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present it, but I'm gonna ask Kim McCarthy, who is um kind of been my um, right hand woman. Um <laughs> uh, uh, you know, really who's helped with the orchestration of um, all the elementary schools and working with the principals and the, and the principals obviously Chrissy also had a um, hand in creating this as well but she was kind of the author I do want to say right up front that Frontier has a different calendar slightly different but they're also going to be talking about a two-week delay too so um, as well so let me present my screen and Kim can you jump on and 
Appreciate yes. it. Makes you good. And so, um, call so this hasn't been um, communicated to the teachers really at all yet either. You're no, it, it, my timeline is so, so this is, this is what people have to understand. Like, and I know in teachers that haven't heard it yet. So this is the draft I'm presenting to you guys tonight. It's very much a draft. I think mm -hmm. the strongest thing is within this draft is to know that we're looking at a two week delay. Everything okay. outside of that, I want to talk it over with teachers, um, you know, and administrators and that kind of, I mean, administrators have already been talking about this again in the last 48 hours, but really, um, you know, I want to digest this internally and then um, internally, that means including teachers and such, and then I'll, I'll send it out to parents. I know parents are going to hear this, you know, through this public meeting tonight that we're thinking this, um, and it's going to affect, have to affect their, their, excuse me, their plans as well. Mm -hmm. So. Hey, Darius, can you bring the percentage up to 150? I think it'll be a little bit easier to see since it's its debut run. We, we want mm -hmm. it to look beautiful. <laughs> so there Thank it is you. a little bit. Yeah, there it is a little bit bigger. And we, you know, we come off of uh, the August summer vacation to start the 10 day PDs for teaching staff. That was um, given to us by the state and it's very we are so very grateful that the teachers will have 10 days of professional development starting on august 26 and you see those pinkish days those all represent those 10 days of professional development and there's a professional development calendar that goes along with that then the remote orientations were moved up to the 10th and 11th we were originally going to do orientations in a combination of in-person and remote, but given the recommendations from the local health board, we are making plans to have them done remotely. And at those orientations, you'll still get all that great information about schedules and technology workshops, social emotional games and activities, obviously the um, health and safety procedures, and you'll get a packet sent to you prior to that, and then a bunch of different dates. Those orientations are for students and families, and we have a lot of fun things planned for those days. So look for the schedule for that. Then if we bring it down to the next band, this is what Darius is talking about, that delay. Originally, we had students come right in for cohort A and cohort B on half days in phase one, but now we're adding those days to be remote days to give us some time to you know, slow down things, make sure everything is in and ready to go. So um, those first five days will all be done remotely. And then Wednesdays will remain an early release day. Um, for professional development. So you'll see that purplish color all the way through that all children in the district will be uh, accessing their education remotely. So to allow us to continue the work, we have four pillars of work that we're doing in professional development. Obviously, it's, it's the health and safety, it's the um, remote learning platforms, blended platforms, hybrid platforms that we really want to knock out of the park. We want that uh, education to be so quality for the children that that we will be analyzing, evaluating, you know, shifting, pivoting, and, and continuing to grow that. We have our um, anti-racism curriculum and professional development. That is a big initiative for us that this year, and that will happen at that day. And the final pillar for our um, professional development is really about mining the gaps. Well, you, you know, our education was disrupted back in March, and we want to make sure that the children can access grade level standards and to really innovate, explore, grow to their maximum capacities. And that's what we're going to be looking at, focusing on math and ELA primarily on those days. So when you see that the um, special programs and high need students, that's what Holly was talking about. They will be starting remotely those days. And each building, Waitley's professionals will be talking with parents that, that are in that high need um, category. That next week, when you see that oranges color on the 21st and 22nd, that's when they're, they're starting to come in the building. So our high needs populations will be starting to come in that the building the week of the 21st to the 25th. And we're really um, looking at that first week as half days for them, right, to all get acclimated. 
When you see that light pinkish oranges color on the 24th and 25th, that's our phase one. That's the one that we wanted to start right away. That's when we go cohort A, cohort B. But we put a sub step in there because we really want to do the responsive classrooms in a very deep way. So what we are doing is having half cohort A come in one day and then the other half come in and then half cohort B. So you see they're going to kind of rotate between the Thursday and Friday of that previous week to the 28th and 29th. So that's another sub step that we're adding in. The September 30th is that typical day where it's um, all children remote in the morning and all staff PD in the afternoon. And then October 1st starts the real deal right, the real phase, and we're moving to full days that day. So cohort A, if they're coming on um, the Mondays and Thursdays, we will build capacity to go full days. And that runs down through, and there's the vacation, the Indigenous Peoples Day that we have off. And we have it marked out until um, the 30th of November. Dears, if you go down to the very bottom of the box where there's language, yet right up just a little bit, so that first star was the specialized programs such as leaps and wings and Waitley doesn't have a specialized program except for preschool, right? That is considered a specialized program because we want to capture those children as early as we can. And you heard Chrissy talk about the plan there. And then the high needs students that are starting that in that pink right away um, are listed and um, Holly, you did such a great job. Uh, listing what the regs say. Each principal is looking at this and defining these categories for the building and making individualized plans. Those planning meetings will happen during the 10-day teacher professional development. And then the language down the bottom just reminds us because it's been a long time that we've been talking about things and we've been shifting quite a bit. So the true phase one is the half-day cohorts, A, B, A, B with that Wednesday. Phase two is full day cohorts, so full day A, full day B, Wednesdays that same, full day A, full day B on Thursday and Friday. And then phase three, we start expanding our full days till we get to full capacity with a schedule that kind of looks like last year's schedule to a degree, right, as much as we can. And really, it's, it's all those opening of the gates that we've been talking about and Meg did such a great job and Darius is monitoring to those. So it's not like a calendar date um, opens the gate. It's so many other things. So this is just a draft or a model to kind of get you to think of how it looks over the course of time. And that's, that's the modification, the slow down calendar. And if you have any questions, I know Darius and I, we've been talking a lot about it and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a question about how the students are gonna be assigned to their cohorts and the remote, like so for the first few days, are the students all going to school all day or is it just for certain times of the day? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Katie, and I know Chrissy is, is dying to jump on, but all Waitley kids will be going to school with all Waitley teachers. We're keeping town by town. We are the when the numbers came in, there was not a need to hire a separate teacher to do remote learning and it's district wide. So if you're a Waitley student, you will be educated through Waitley Elementary School. And we just celebrate. We jumped so high for that. That was something that we wanted and we're losing sleep about. <laughs> then then what happened is Chrissy has this huge, big <laughs> spreadsheet and has all the children that are defined on who's hybrid, who's remote, who's high needs, what the plan. And she is um, developing that and working with her teachers. She's already met. Chrissy, you'll have to jump on. You've already met once or twice with your teachers. So we're really looking at the instructional design to maximize the, the learning from the most skillful teacher for all children in a group of peers. So when you said that Waitley kids are gonna be taught by Waitley teachers, um, does that include the student, the families who chose remote for their um, plan? Yes, it does. And Chrissy, do you want me to keep going or do you want to drop on, jump on? I know you've put so much. I'm happy to keep going if you want. 
No, that's um, figuring that part out is still a work in progress. We're sort of trying to line up all the resource that, resources that we have. And, um, you know, one of the, the biggest concerns that the community had and I had and the teachers had was that if students were receiving a remote program from someone who was not a Waitley teacher, they would be fit pretty, pretty well disconnected from what was going on at Waitley Elementary School. And that's not really something that we wanted for any of our kids. We really enjoy our close community and we didn't want to lose that. So um, the logistics of it are going to be a little tricky because we also didn't want to overburden teachers by asking them to split their attention and provide two distinctly different paths of learning. So all of those things are being worked on. I'm working with um, a team at the school level. You know, we've done a lot of district work, but we've also been meeting as a, as a team um, with my instructional leadership team. Um, I have 15 different schedules, possibilities in terms of cohorts, because what I was trying to do um, was make sure that the I could minimize the amount of families who were going to be impacted by having kids on opposite cohorts. Um, and what I've gotten it down to is um, a combination of grades that that leaves us with six families who would be impacted by having students in both cohort cohorts. Excuse me. Um, and I am I'm also working on being able to offer something for those families so that on the day that the younger student comes to school, the older student would come too, but but do their remote learning on site with um, a staff member at the school so that we can provide equally, it's not, it's not great, it's not ideal, but I don't wanna offer some families two days a week that they can go to work or do whatever and offer other families um, no days a week that they are child free. So we're trying to, keep things as as uh, equal as possible, offer the greatest opportunities for all of our kids. Um, and it really has been, you know, I, I, I've worried all along that parents think we're withholding information or that we're, um, you know, not working on this as, as hard as we're working on it. Um, it's a lot of pieces to pull together and it's a project that none of us have ever worked on before. And the, the realities that keep hitting us um, every day there's some some new exciting challenge to meet and we are meeting those challenges it just um, it takes a lot of patience a lot of flexibility and um, I'm incredibly grateful to be in a school like Waitley the size of Waitley where we are going to be able to be nimble and address the the issues like the for example the issue of families that have siblings on opposite cohorts they're not going to be able to account for that in, in larger schools, in larger districts. But for us, it comes down to a manageable, num manageable number to be able to accommodate that. So um, I'm, I'm confident with the attitude that the staff members bring and the families that we are going to hit challenges. There's no doubt about that. But that we will be able to jump into those challenges with a positive attitude and um, find creative solutions to things. So um, follow up to that. When you said the Waitley, the remote kids will be taught by a Waitley teacher, will it be their classroom teacher or a different Waitley teacher? I, I think it's going to be a, a combination of things. Like there will be times when um, they will be remoted into the classroom to watch the classroom teacher do a lesson. But then when it's time for independent work or small group work, they might be working with somebody else but I want them connected to their actual classroom. Okay, I do appreciate I just, all I your just, hard work too. Thank you. I, I know you guys are working hard. Chrissy, I just wanted to pop on too. We've been asked because of COVID to think in terms of teaching teams, right? And teaching teams can look differently at a singleton school like Waitley than they do at a place like Deerfield that would have three, uh, three kindergarten teachers, three second grade teachers. So Chrissy's really shifting the mindset about what is our teaching team here in Waitley and how do we get the match between the educational activity and the provider for those students across the sixth grade. And it's really, if you've ever played Tetris, it's like putting all those little blocks together. And she's she and her team have been so busy doing it. But really we did the happy dance when we 
when we figured out that Waitley kids could stay in Waitley and, and I think Chrissy, I can still hear you singing. <laughs> yeah, that one, that was a, that was a tough one for me. And early on without knowing numbers, without knowing what was going to happen, it was just one of those things that might have ended up being our reality. But um, now as we get closer and the, the numbers are clearer and the overall plan is clear, it, it's, um, I'm finally feeling a little bit of relief over being able to solve some of those problems that we've seen popping up all along. And um, I, I would be entirely sunk without the support of my um, the district leaders as well as my um, principal colleagues. Bob, Bob, did you have a question? Bob, go ahead. Uh, I don't know, Chrissy or, or Kim, is Teaching in a classroom with, we'll say, if you have a classroom of 18 kids, so if nine are remote and nine are hybrid or in the classroom, is it as easy as standing in front of a computer and teaching a class to the, it's not like having a, a TV camera and hooked up to their, why now, not? We're going to be looking for opportunities where that might be the case. I'm there may be some. There it's may, not there easy. There will be certain instances, I'm thinking, for example, um, if the teacher's doing a read aloud, that the, the students could be remoted in from home to participate in that. Um, but it's gonna take some really careful planning and thinking about where are those opportunities for the kids who are at home to become part of the lesson that's going on. Um, under normal circumstances, this piece would be even more challenging because the way that elementary education works now um, is that kids work in groups, everything is collaborative. Um, teachers are with small groups all the time. We're really trying to meet the individual needs of kids, but that's going to have to look a little bit different now. You know, there's the kids cannot be working in groups, and the teacher can't really be bopping around the classroom and um, you know working working with everybody in the way that they're used to. So, to some degree, that makes it a little bit easier. The teacher's going to have to stay a little more still than um, she may be used to, which lends itself to being able to have someone in the classroom to help out with. Um, not filming, but using their computer to follow what the what the teacher is doing and bring those other kids in. And, and it also requires someone, um, the way that we do in these meetings, someone to be monitoring the chat box. So if a student who is working at home is remoting into the classroom, there needs to be someone who can recognize that that student has a question or a comment to make and to be able to um, make that happen within the classroom. So it's it's a lot. It's not, I wish it was as easy, you know, in a college course, it could work that way. It does work that way very regularly because the it's stand and deliver. Professor stands up there, delivers information. You either learn it, learn it or you don't. And it doesn't really work like that happily. It does not work that way in elementary education. All right. Thanks. So I'm sure there's lots of other questions on this. Um, and it sounds like it's still a work in progress, which is um, you know, going to be our, our motto, I think, for the next few weeks. The one question I have is when do you think you'll be able to share some of this information with the families? Because I think families are going to just start getting anxious about knowing a little more certainty around what they need to be doing for planning purposes. And maybe that's a hard question to answer, but if you could just share sort of your thoughts on how that's going to get communicated out and when. Yeah, that's not a hard question to answer. Um, Today, after looking at the numbers, and um, Mary did a great job of trying to make sure we had all the right numbers of who's coming you know, into school hybrid and who's remote, um, today was that I was finally able to nail down that um, plan for what grades are coming with which cohort in order to minimize. There's a whole lot of things. I wanted to minimize the number of families impacted by kids coming in two cohorts. I needed certain grades to come to school together because the numbers balance out. There were just a lot of things. So. Um, that part is all set. I have a parent handbook that I want to share that's got some information about it, about, um, you know, our health and safety protocols and some of our procedures, like what's arrival going to look like, what's dismissal going to look like. I have that. I met with the, um, the parents from the school council last week and they gave me some input about some additional things that families might want to want to learn about. So early next week, I'm planning to have um, family meetings and I, I I believe I'm going to um, follow Kristen Gordon's example and have one meeting for families who, who have students who are going to be full remote learners, and then another one for the folks who are doing hybrid. Um, and then sometime, 
obviously before kids start, we want um, some tech training for families so that uh, they can be let in on some of the things that uh, we didn't have a chance to to train about last year. We Everyone got thrown into this. And we understand how frustrating that was for parents to not know. Uh-oh. She frozen. To uh -oh. not know what they're doing. I'll <laughs> finish the sentence. Um, okay. I don't know, Darius, if you can finish up. But it sounds like you have a plan for communicating starting next week. Families are going to hear about their cohorts and about the schedules and the technology related to each of those. And then the first day of school depends on which cohort you're in. Is that how it's going to work? Or is the first day of school? Well, I mean, the, the, the first same. day of school, the first day of school will be, um, you know, will be the 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 tenth and eleventh. It's just going to be start remoting. It's going to start remote, right? So everybody so goes. There'll, 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 there'll be there'll be orientation. So all that information is going to come out, and then you know the teachers will be sending out their packet of information and stuff. Um, I think we scheduled it at the beginning as part of their professional development, um, giving them some time to collaborate together at the end of that first week. So. Um, like the 26th, 27th, that going into that weekend, parents will get it still, still be a full week ahead of time um, that the teacher will have time to reach out to as well to talk about their classroom stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, <clears throat> so it's coming. It's going to come fast and furious. But yeah. Yeah, it is. The weeks are going to go by quickly at this point. So, this, this change in plans, though, I mean, it could possibly change families' decisions on what they want to do in theory. Right, if they want to do remote or hybrid, but we already, everyone already sent their their decision. In. Yeah, in theory, if the week of school makes the difference, and they want to do yeah, do I mean, the it's only thing. two weeks, right? Of, <laughs> right, right, right. But also having a Waitley teacher, if you choose remote, um, that was important to a lot of people. That could affect the decision. Well, is, isn't it that anyone can always go remote if they decide they want to go remote? Right, but they weren't going to have a Waitley necessarily have a Waitley teacher. It would have been a district teacher. That's how, that's what the plan said before today. Mm -hmm. right. So that's new information for people. Right. right. So they could, they would have to, you know, they're, you know we're going to have the windows where they can go from remote to hybrid and they can always leave hybrid to go to remote. So, um, and everyone's remote for the first two weeks. So, gotcha. so they'll get a taste for that at that point. Um, well, this puts us more in line with um, other districts in our area having a delayed, um, you know, starting off remote. That might help us out with all the kids coming back um, into the area to colleges and the private schools. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, what's interesting is that as I watched what was going on around the area, because obviously I'm on calls with all these other superintendents, their process has been, um, I would even say more chaotic than our process. I mean, we have more meetings and more, you know, because of our five five different schools, but it's been a very difficult, I really, I think that's, you know, and my, I think school committees have been put in a difficult situation. The state has kind of, I think, has given us a terrible model to fall into. The fact that we have to provide two different models you know, the community chose to go hybrid, but I have to do hybrid and remote with the same level of resources. Um, when, the state, when the state launched this idea, they were expecting that the majority of people would be hybrid and that the remote model would be all third party software, that they were actually offering us different uh, modules that we could choose from for those students who are going to remote assigned with the teacher. And right from the beginning, you know, we may not have said um, a town teacher because we wanted to keep our options open. Um, we were saying, well, let's keep our teacher at least in district so that we can have a level of standard that's where we think it should be. Because we saw they were, they were running off a platform we've seen before and we weren't thinking it was the strongest. So, um, you know, so we wanted to kind of control that. So, I mean, I think really we were, I just got to say that this is how it kind of unfolded and it's not the prettiest. Yeah. We're trying to make a pretty picture out of where we started, not so great as a pretty spot. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. And, and <clears throat> I guess the other thing I'd be careful about is it's not really a delay. Like we're starting school on the 10th <laughs> based correct. on what you're saying. It's just um, easing into the hybrid model. So we're starting right. with a consistent approach of remote for everybody, which is 
not a bad thing because we we're always hearing that we may have to go remote at some point anyway. So this will give everybody a good solid grounding in the remote process. But then we're working towards the hybrid, which is what the school committees wanted and what the school recommended initially. And that's, right. and that's, that is a good way to put it. And that's, you know, I have my, the, the spin on it that we'll be able to do these other things better and that, that kind of thing. And so um, it, it, I do know as from a public perspective, it's gotta be, fr it's gotta be frustrating that things are changing. Um, but you wanna, you wanna be frustrating, you can sit in my seat for a little while because of the amount of moving parts that we're, you know, and we're still gonna have to adjust, you know, adjust the schedule slightly, you know, um, I, I hopefully not to have to change the, the what, when students are coming back in the building and that kind of thing, but um, you know, we're, you know, we're working out the details of that as well, so. Okay, so what's the next step for us? Is there anything we need to do? I mean, it sounds like from a school committee perspective, it's not changing our vote necessarily. It is, and when we did the vote, I, I asked the school committee to give me flexibility about changing the, the rollout of the model. Um, mm -hmm. to, we, I said, Mary said, we really are gonna have to slow this down. Um, this does it slightly a larger slowdown than what I was prepared to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, it could, you know, school committees could say, no, you know, that's not what we voted, the, the model we voted is very different, but I, I think most people can see this is kind of, you saw, you saw where Chrissy was talking about the amount of moving parts, because we are trying to, we can't make everybody happy, but we're trying to meet everybody's needs. Right. And I think that's right. kind of the, whether or not they think it's their needs or not, <laughs> we're trying to make sure we meet everybody's needs. Um, and so I think that's what this slowdown is going to be able to do. And this will give the teachers and the building staff chance to get a much better grounding in how everything's going to work going forward, which I think will, should go a long way. Yeah, I mean, we're still in our professional development days. They're going to have to work about a lot on the reopening and, and spending time mm -hmm. toward that. But at least it's not going to feel like there's a, you know, a, you know, a, an end that they, they can't prepare fast enough for. Right. So, OK, so we need to move on because I know some of you have to disappear for a meeting at seven. but. Um, We'll regroup to hear more about this or more specifics about what's the plan there. Yeah, so we, we, you, we should talk about, we should call a, a meeting for, I would say, um, today's the 18th, maybe like September 1st or something like that. The first week in September, okay. Yeah, you know, give a, give a, a week. Um, okay. and then we can give an update there. Um, and then I don't want to lose sight of the CPAC update or the, discussion on their concerns and the questions. So we do have 20 minutes. Can we talk about that Absolutely. Um, quickly? And I, have, and, I have, and I have Karen here to kind of address, I think some of the things are directed straight toward Karen on what's happening with that. And I know she's been um, putting things together this week. So um, if you like Karen, Karen, you there? What? I hit, I hit uh, my camera, I forgot to unmute. Hi everybody, <laughs> happy Hi. to be here. Um, I'll start by just kind of giving an update. Um, I'll try to um, touch upon some of the things that came out um, in the CPAC. I was listening to it for the, for the first time, so I wrote a few things down, but please then ask any questions and, and we'll do this by dialogue. Um, I think the one thing that was noted was the uh, guidance that came out on uh, July 6th uh, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And that was the guidance on unfolding special education in the time of COVID. Uh, and it really did focus on uh, in whatever model you fall into to prioritize additional in-person services for your most complex students um, and early childhood. Uh, mm -hmm. It went on to define, as Holly stated, it went on to define uh, the complex students as students that are um, out of the classroom um, in substantially separate classrooms that's a placement, we call it in special ed. It's, it's called substantially separate placement. It means you're out of the classroom more than 60% of the time. Uh, it goes on to then also note um, any student who cannot access remote, homeless students, foster students, ELL, English language learners rather, uh, to increase um, to the extent feasible really uh, based upon safety and health concerns, uh, the in-person in instruction. So as a district, um, and as noted at the Sunderland meeting, I mentioned that uh, we do have substantially separate programs. Many of our students who are in these substantially separate programs, I do note you're Waitley and you don't have one, I'll get there. But uh, 
many of our students who are in substantially separate programs, their placement page doesn't say substantially separate placement because we're so good at inclusion. They're, they have an intensive teacher. Uh, we recognize them as students that um, have intensive teachers or have wraparound services from this program, but they go into the general ed. So what I was saying, and please know I, communicating with DESI, I'm communicating with my colleagues uh, throughout the area and the state, and I said the majority of districts are really focusing on those first priority, those students in substantially separate programs receiving increased in person. But uh, in our district, uh, we will be looking closely at our students who are associated with these programs, whether or not their placement page says substantially separate because of our inclusive practices. Um, and I did say in Sunderland, we'll be focusing students that are recognized as in CAST to, for communication purposes with uh, that school committee um, and that population there. Uh, it's very complex. I've been, I just recently started to talk about what model we're working with, uh, the complexities of working as we discussed with the remote model. At the same time, we're developing the hybrid model. Um, and I know in Waitley, and I'm looking at uh, Chrissy right now, and I know in Waitley she has been communicating uh, with the faculty, as Holly said, uh, she would be. Uh, as far as, since there is no substantially separate program in Waitley, it's not as if we don't want to meet the needs. Uh, I am completely invested in special education and an advocate for special needs um, and invested my life in uh, communicating and advocating for special needs students. Um, that we will be looking at our students' needs, we will be reaching out and communicating with families as far as addressing why we don't have IEP meetings, uh, you know, IEP meetings before the start of the school year, uh, in fact, it's because mostly we don't have faculty. So IEP meetings need to include a special education, a general education teacher, uh, and we, it's very difficult to do IEP meetings. But I also want to note that the guidance for DESE is to engage parents, find out what their needs are, talk to them, have them in the process through phone calls or emails. And then we are obligated to play back and notify parents how and when their IEP services will deliver, be delivered. It's not an IEP change. It's a notification of how we're doing IEP services differently in the time of COVID. They have a stay put and the IEP stays the same. So you gather input from parents, which we will be doing during our planning time or professional development time, and then we'll play it back. And I wish we could do it sooner. I mean, I understand families are, are frustrated. Uh, we need our faculty back and we needed the model that we're working with. We needed the numbers of who's gonna be remote. Uh, we also need to take into consideration the accommodations of our faculty. Uh, there's many new moving pieces when we're deciding this. So parents will be notified of the how and whens. It will be done in a, a tiered approach. Um, as you saw from the presentation by Kim and Chrissy, uh, we are planning on doing our opening uh, in person, our substantially separate programs uh, or our vulnerable students uh, earlier than we move to in person. We are working with our teachers not, um, that are the teachers, intensive teachers of our uh, substantially separate programs and working with them to their availability and what is possible. Um, and if the last thing I can at least, uh, what is possible as far as our staffing and our teachers and our students needs as far as parents choosing remote or hybrid. And I do wanna just say too, after we spoke, you know, this is complicated and we're partnering with parents as closely as we can. I am in communication daily with a number of parents and families, uh, faculty, uh, administrators. And you know, for the most part, our, our communications are very positive. Um, and the feedback I got from parents, um, even after the Sunderland meeting and others is, is, is of a positive, empathic, as we return that empathy, um, and remain positive in our partnership. This is very complex and I understand it can touch upon st stressful nerves, um, but we continue to put one foot in front of another and work to pull the pieces one step at a time together uh, to define our practices and uh, work to follow the DESE guidance um, 
and sometimes step a little bit further along than the DESE guidance. Um, we're always working to build the best continuum of services we can. Um, and again, I'm uh, Waitley, uh, I know that Chrissy is working and we talked about, since there's no substantially separate program, who are those most vulnerable students or high need students without using a placement page to describe them uh, by reaching out to parents and using the information that they gathered from uh, the spring and going into the fall and looking at who's remote, who's hybrid, um, and how to meet those hybrid needs, those remote needs, and those increased uh, in-person capacity for our students with special needs. So can I can I pop in and hopefully I yeah. won't uh, I won't no, have to just I, say tag, I know you're back. You're working back. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make this as brief as possible. Um, so when we think about the the guidelines and the things that Desi wants us to do, we certainly are going to be following those. But that's not, in my estimation, that's not enough for us. Um, I, well, I'm going to be prioritizing students with 504s and IEPs, students who are English learners, students who, for a variety of reasons, were not able to access the general curriculum through online learning. Um, and there, there are many reasons for that. And, you know, we will meet as teams to figure out plans for all these kids. And I don't mean like a plan, a formal IEP, but I mean, what is our plan gonna be for addressing the needs of, of the kids, the needs we already know about, and the many needs that we can't anticipate yet because we don't know, it's been so long since we've been with our kids and they've been through so much that there are gonna be a whole lot of needs we need to address that um, may take us by surprise. And this is another time when it's really good to be to have the community that we have and to be able to be nimble enough to address things as they come along, whether you have a plan or you don't have a plan. Um, certainly we wanna prioritize the kids who have plans. We already know a lot of the challenges that they'll be facing. And uh, one of the great things about Waitley, and I feel like I say that all the time, but one of the many great things about Waitley is that while our students will be having a new classroom teacher, their service providers will largely remain the same. I'm in the middle of presenting. Sorry. Um, the classroom teacher will be new, but the service providers will not. So when we gather as a team to talk about these students, the service providers know the student, the families know the student, and it's only the classroom teacher who um, probably does already know the student, but um, needs to get to know the student a little bit better. So I feel like we're, we're at an advantage in terms of that. And I really want to be able to look at what each child needs um, provide what is in the IEP, provide what's in the service delivery grid, but also be thinking really closely about how we're taking care of our kids' social and emotional needs at, in the midst of this complete craziness. Um, so again, I would ask parents to um, continue to be so patient. I appreciate that so much, but we really, really want to meet everyone's needs. It's, it's at the top of our list. Every person that works at Whaley works really hard to meet the needs as they arise. That's good to hear, Chrissy, because um, it sounded like before when Karen was talking that um, she's really focusing on, if I correct me if I'm wrong, the high needs and kids in special classrooms, which is not really what's happening at Waitley. And I think a lot of parents are concerned about their kids that are in IEPs that are not in those special programs. And we really need to have some concrete plans in place for them. And we already know who those kids are regardless of whether they decided to go remote or um, hybrid. So we already be thinking about that. And it sounds like you're doing a lot of work. It's just that not, the concrete work won't happen until those teachers are back, which won't happen until um, August 26th or so. So that at that point, you'll start being more, there'll be more specifics for the families. Is that a fair? <laughs> There, there will be, but I, I'll also say that I, you know, I, all of our special educators, I've been in touch with them. They're already making their list. They're already looking at service delivery grids to figure out how are we going to piece all of this together to make sure everyone gets what they need. The kids remote, the kids who are um, in person, who's going to come in for um, some in person, just drop in services. So it's not as if on. Uh, the 26 teachers will come to school and begin thinking about these things. The, the thought process has been going since, well, since March 16th. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to schedule all the, all the meetings and give parents the particulars. But um, we're going to do our very best to get people information as fast as possible. 
without um, jumping the gun and giving information that is inaccurate. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions on this, uh, Bob or Maureen? Thank you guys. It's I, th I think the hard part of being a parent is not no information. You kind of jump to the worst conclusions when you don't know what's happening. But it sounds like there is a lot of work happening, a lot of thought going into it, and there will be communication more about more specifics to everybody. Um, not too long, not too far away. And I think the last thing to add there is if any parent is struggling with questions uh, to reach out to Chrissy or if it's specific to special education and policy and process and where we're at, uh, mm -hmm. to reach out, uh, to, we're totally accessible, call, touch base with somebody. We're communicating constantly and there's nothing more we wanna do than continue to communicate and find those avenues to communicate with people. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I know we we're supposed to, that was all on our um, agenda for today, but now we only have eight minutes. Do we want to go into an executive session or do we want to so, just... So Katie, I can give you guys an update in executive session on, the, on the, how things are going. I, I'll let Bob know, he can start the meeting up. It's financials to start off, so we could have almost 10 minutes with me. And I got it on the computer next to me going, so I'll be, I'll be able to see what's going on there, so. Okay. I think it'd be good to get you guys an update of what's going on. So can you walk me through the process here? I'm sorry for going to executive session again We're from here. We're going to do a roll so call to go to the executive session, not to return to regular sessions. So there's no business that we'll be going back to. But we don't need to return to this meeting. That's correct. So, okay. So I will thank everybody for joining us tonight, for all the information, for all the hard work. Appreciate everybody's patience and diligence in getting a Waitley um, back in action. Um, and we, I will ask for a roll call to go into executive session at this point. Um, Bob? A, I'm not going to exec session. Oh, you're not going, motion. right. Motion to go into executive session, uh, Mass General Law 30A, Section 21A3, in regards to collective bargaining with teachers and aides. I second. Okay, and Bob? Michelle, Michelle, yes. I don't need to, so you can go to the other meeting. Okay. Yes. Maureen? Yes. Katie? Yes. So we'll end this meeting and we'll move over to the other meeting. And thank you again. Thank you.